Good day. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom. Thank you very much for having me. Glad to have you. For our audience, uh, let's introduce you and let's start off with where did you grow up? Well, I grew up, I tell people I grew up everywhere. I never stayed in one place longer than three years until I graduated high school in New Hampshire. Um, I lived for three years in Lubbock, Texas, which is the first time I was in one place for three years. And I claim New Hampshire is where I grew up because I graduated from high school there and stayed for another three years. So other than that, I've been moving around in increments of three years, and uh, but I've been all over the United States. So let's t talk a little bit about uh, your schooling before you enter the world of work. Actually, when I was uh, in high school, my father told me that I'm most likely never going to go to college. I what, didn't have the capacity of going to college, so I didn't plan on going to school. Ultimately, after a number of years of uh, working, um, going through periods of homeless, homelessness and hunger, I found myself in school. I had a friend that uh, said if I would move to Idaho, he could get me into school. So I went to Idaho and started in Ricks College and uh, ended up getting a bachelor's in philosophy, what I refer to as a BS and BS from the University of Utah. I have a master's in criminal justice from Virginia, Con Con sorry, Virginia Commonwealth University. And I have half an MBA and half a MA in philosophy that I'd love to finish at some point. I see. So uh, how did you get into the whole area of instructional design? Well, it's, uh, I've heard mentioned before a book called The Accidental Instructional Designer, and I definitely fall into that. I uh, didn't realize I was doing instructional design until 2007 when I was offered a job as an instructional designer for the Defense Department. I've been doing it since 2000, I'm sorry, since 1994 when I became a firearms instructor and a range master for a law enforcement supply store and uh, started developing my own training. I saw that uh, there was differences in types of training. I had the experience of good training in Army and Marine Corps basic training, and then I had the experience of bad training in law enforcement training um, a couple decades later. So, but it was with firearms instruction that I really discovered training and um, how to develop training to achieve certain performance because of how um, CCW training was done in Utah, where you only have to you only have to sit in a classroom for 15 minutes, get the laws and leave. And I immediately knew that there was a problem with that. In firearms and law enforcement training, they teach you vicarious liability, which is I'm responsible, legally and civilly responsible for anything that I train somebody to do. And I did not feel comfortable putting people out on the street with a carry concealed weapons license without knowing that they could actually use the firearm. So me and a handful of other firearms instructors required people, if they attended our CCW class, they had to demonstrate proficiency and safety with that firearm. If they couldn't, I wouldn't sign off on them. But I've carried that, that level of expectation through all of my training, whether it's for web technology companies, law enforcement, travel, banking, anything I develop training for, I take it very seriously because of vicarious liability that I'm personally responsible for somebody being able to perform their actions. I didn't know there was a science behind it until I was offered a job at the Defense Department, like I said, for the Personnel Recovery Education Training Center, when I learned that all this time I've been developing training and developing uh, curriculum for uh, universities and community colleges, that there's actually a science behind creating training called instructional design. So they uh, hired me because of my experience, and because of my master's degree, but then they put me through a Langevin instructional design course actually learn the science, the terminology, and the process. Love to discover that there's a process. Now that there's multiple processes, Addy, Sam, Agile, and such, um, it's just become a, a lifelong excitement with uh, developing training, specifically to get people to perform a certain way. So can you share with us uh, some of the more interesting kinds of projects that you've worked on as an instructional designer? I don't know if there's actually one project that I could point to. The thing that I enjoy most about instructional design is the process of bringing 
different capabilities and technologies and processes from the different siloed industries. Law enforcement does training one particular way. Technologies, you know, corporate world does it another way. And I found that my, my experience in law enforcement and military training is that it's very do it. They're going to demonstrate it and they're going to have you do it. In the corporate world, a lot of training is watch a PowerPoint or a slide deck or somebody, you know, a guru behind the pulpit tells you how to do it and then they expect you to do it. So my favorite projects have been where I've been able to take a training that currently exists that has a low success rate, adding performance to it, adding doing the thing and seeing a much greater experience, uh, a much greater capability of people to perform. Just like I said, with the vicarious liability, my passion isn't, look at this e-learning I developed. My passion is, are people doing what they're expected to do when they finish it? Um, and I've had a number of projects where I've been able to do that. And I've been in another in a lot of situations where people are like, no, we just want you to do this thing. And it falls. And they blame the instructional designer for that. They don't blame the process. They don't blame the, the freedom that they gave me. And they didn't, and they don't blame themselves for taking a learning professional and putting them in a box and expecting out of the box training. Mm -hmm. Can you share with us a little bit about your first formal exposure to uh, what I would call human performance technology? It's also known by other names, human performance improvement and such, but it's that focus on performance. Now you seem to have come to that uh, naturally um, in, in your early work, but but when did you first, you know, you said you discovered that there was this thing called instructional design and some of that instructional design has a performance orientation and some of it doesn't, but when, what was your first real exposure to that and, and who did you learn from or what did you learn from books, articles, people, et cetera? Most of what I've come to in instructional design <clears throat> has been a process of doing it. Um, much like I've trained people to do things and develop complexity, you know, take complex things and make them simple. I've, it's happened for me too. You know, uh, I've had a number of mentors through life that have said, you know, have you thought about doing this way? You know, have you seen people act this way? Um, but a lot of it has been observing. Like I said, in military, I learned what, what good training looks like. And in the law enforcement, I learned what bad training looks like, where we would sit in a room for days just bleeding from the eyeballs with being told how things are done. One, th one time, you know, having taken learning about performance, not knowing that there was a science behind it, you know, taking processes and projects and developing things that created capability and then finding out that there's a science behind it has been, has been a great experience for me. Uh, it's only been in the last, it's only been since 2007 where I've heard performance outcomes. You know, it started out as just training objectives. And then diving into it, I would always ask the questions like, okay, here's your training objective, but what do you want them to do? Um, I think it's only been in the last several years that I've heard people actually refer to it as performance. When I've been asking, what do you want them to do? <clears throat> now we have the word, what do you, how do you want them to perform? It's kind of the same thing. Problem is, is that the people who use the jargon are usually the people within the industry you can't use that with people outside the industry because they're they're kind of baffled by that. So, for instance, and in, uh, we did talk about performance, and I really the light bulb went off for me a lot when I redesigned the patrol tactics for my academy. Um, before we did patrol tactics, it was a lot of watching a lot of videos, hearing war stories, and you know learning the liabilities, and that was about it. So a lieutenant and I, I asked, he said, hey, do you want to help me with this class? I said, will you let me redesign it? And he was like, sure, do whatever you want. First half of the day, we would talk about what we wanted them to do. We talk about this is what we're going to study today. Here is what you're going to be able to do at the end of it. And then the last half of the day, we actually had them do that. Um, I didn't realize how much of a good job we had done until the very next, uh, the very next iteration of training for uh, DUI investigations. The state police always taught DUI investigations. Part of patrol techniques was teaching them how to do traffic stops. And we would have them, we would have our role players scripted so that they would only act within a certain level of boundaries. 
we give them an airsoft gun. And if the person who was doing the traffic stop didn't do it correctly and put themselves in an unsafe position, they would get shot with an airsoft gun. It's uh, You learn very quickly when you're getting things thrown at you. So I found out later when I was participating in the DUI inve uh, investigation training, the uh, um, state troopers came up to me and they're like, you taught patrol tactics, right? I said, yeah, why? He said, we have never had a class that was so spot on in their safety and their procedure in traffic stops ever. What did you do? What did you do different? And I told him we trained them to perform. And that was one of the first times I ever thought about performance, but I hadn't actually heard it as a, as a technology and as research science until the last several years. And I've been diving into it and reading it more learning about the theories and learning about the applications and stuff like that. If you're a learning professional and you're not constantly learning, you're not a learning professional. Can you share with us uh, some of the people now that you're, you're looking at? So who are some of your more formal uh, influences in this uh, realm? Um, I've, I've read a lot of your stuff and I watch a lot of your videos. That helps. Um, Will Tallhammer's uh, learning transfer evaluation model. I absolutely love it. It's uh, um, it's something I'm trying to bring, and I think that has more application to a lot of the types of training that I'm involved in than Kirkpatrick's four levels of evaluation. I've never really been a fan of that, which I'm sure is going to cause a conflagration of debate somewhere. But uh, the learning transfer evaluation model, I think, is has more is more efficient and has more application, especially when it comes into um, performance evaluation. It's like, what are you really trying to look at? Not just the ROI, but can people do the things that you're training them to do? Which I think has missed a lot in a lot of training. Um, you can't evaluate whether somebody can do a thing with a 10 question quiz. There are people using training objectives and verbs that imply that you have to observe them performing the act. That should be a clue. That should be a clue for developing training. Is that if you're saying that they have to act a certain way, you need to observe them perform that action to know if they're actually doing it. And that's been a lot of fun for bringing into a lot of the training materials I develop, whether you know it's taking law enforcement practical training and applying it to web technology. How do you get a web, how do you get a tier one web guy to be able to do tech, uh, to do, uh, tech support or troubleshooting? You have them do it and you have them perform it while they're on a, a safe call with somebody who's, who's talking to them. So, do you have any other influences? Uh, you, you've mentioned Will, and you don't have to mention me, but uh, <laughs> anybody else that uh, comes to mind? Well, I think one of the greatest influences I had came from philosophy. You know, a lot of what I do comes from philosophy. Uh, a lot of people say, think philosophy is just, you know, people lying in grass, staring at the sky, thinking what is the meaning of life. That's not what it is at all. It's critical analysis and then getting beat up. So we have to read, then we have to argue with what we read. And when we argue, it better have logic, reason, and evidence to back it up. We can't ever say, well, I just feel that way. Philosophy is a crash course in critical thinking. It's a crash course in analysis. It's critical analysis. And it's not, I don't think people realize that a philosopher bring, if somebody has a philosophy degree, they know how to analyze. They know how to ask the questions. They can see the things and they're trained to do that objectively. You can get passionate about defending your argument, but at the end of the day, it's the argument you're defending, not yourself. So um, the greatest influences for me have been John Locke, David Hume, George Berkeley, who are uh, the fathers of uh, not, well, Francis Bacon is the father of empiricism, but these guys expanded on it and developed empiricism. I'm a, I'm a hard empiricist. And empiricist is about experience. You learn through experience is what it boils down to. But one of the greatest influences on how to train people to do that, how to get people to understand, which is, which is a scary word in instructional design, but in philosophy, it's fully embraced, was uh, one of my favorite philosophy professors, Lex Newman, uh, associate professor at the University of Utah, because that's how he taught classes. And I took that when I was when I was adjunct faculty at different universities and community colleges. I took his way of educating through training and that he would train people to think critically by presenting the information in such a way and then having them do it, 
having them actually do the analysis and have to argue and have to defend their argument with evidence. So those are probably the biggest influences overall. And one of the things that's instilled in me, the desire and the passion for learning and pursuing excellence, making sure that what I train is the best way to actually do that thing. Shift gears here a little bit. Um, so as a way of providing examples to our audience, uh, my question is, if you were to give a 30 second elevator speech on what you currently do, you know, what would that be? And I sometimes set this up as if you're at a neighborhood party and there's a new neighbor, they don't know you, they come up to you and they say, you know, Rick, what do you do? How do you answer that? Well, um, I actually have an easy answer for you and I can do it in less than 30 seconds. Simplifying the complex, then developing the skills to do complex things. And then and that's it. leads to more questions about, well, what does that really mean? Exactly, exactly. So the, the pitch, um, having experience in business and being an entrepreneur, um, having started businesses, having to seek pitches for investment, stuff like that, you have to learn how to be succinct. Well, that applies to instructional design too. The pitch is your hook. You get people interested with the hook. I, it, it's fascinating to me that, that simplifying the complex is what an instructional designer does, but then they can't simplify the complexity of instructional design to other people. So it's a, it's a fun thought game for an instructional designer to do this. I'm glad you asked that question. Because if I can't simplify what I do, how am I simplifying anybody else's what they're doing? Um, so you, I throw that at them and then they ask the questions. Well, what do you mean? What is complex? Well, troubleshooting. Tell me how you're going to troubleshoot. And I ask them the questions and I get them to start thinking about it because that's where the learning is. Learning isn't just vomiting information into somebody's face through a PowerPoint or through their ears with a guru behind the pulpit. It's getting them discussing, getting them thinking, getting them thinking critically and applying that information to themselves and how they relate to it. So my 30 second pitch is designed to do that. So when we get done talking, they walk away with knowledge and understanding and the ability to explain to somebody else what it is that Rick Jacobs does. Whether they go goat-eyed or not tells me how, how effective that training actually was. Thank you. Uh, let me shift gears here again. Um, as a lifelong learner, what, what are you currently focused on for your own learning to help yourself professionally or personally? What what can you share with us? Um, I do best learning by uh, doing. And so I'm working on a number of things. Number one, I'm working on breaking down the silos of industries. The, uh, you know, it's, I've been really fortunate that I've had this experience with a lot of different industries. I've had opportunities to learn things, you know, graphic design, marketing, and advertising. They have learning and training in, in a silo. Uh, web technology or any technology, software development, stuff like that. I've worked in those industries and they develop training as in a silo. They, they develop training the way engineers think that training should be done. You know, travel industry, they learn a different way. Sale, you know, travel industry is sales. So developing salesmen, you train a, a different way. Law enforcement tra trains a different way. All these people have these ideas that in order to be an, an effective instructional designer, I have to be an expert in software development, expert in travel, expert in banking, uh, but that's not true. I'm an expect expert, maybe not at speaking, but I'm an ex expert at simplifying the complex. It doesn't matter what your industry is. It doesn't matter what your topic is. My expertise is analyzing, breaking things down into learnable chunks and training your people to achieve the performance outcomes that you're looking for. So I take I mix and I match. I take the, the doing part you get a lot in law enforcement and military and I apply it to web hosting or I apply it to travel. One of the big things you have in, uh, in all these is people talk about role playing. Well, in law enforcement, if you let the role player run off the, run off the rails, you just turn into ambushing gun battles where everybody is, is, is shy. That doesn't train you on anything except for how to be afraid and how to, and, and move too slow. But you, you develop scripts and you develop this fence so the role players stay within the yard because otherwise role players are going to be like puppies. If you open the door and that fence door is open, they're going to go bounding into the fields of flowers and sunshine, chasing bugs and rabbits and stuff. Well, you develop a script. So I take that, my writing scripts, writing scenarios, and I apply it to travel or I apply it, apply it to software development or technology uh, where 
we found you found that a lot of these companies will in their new hire training give them two weeks of theory and then put them on phones and there's no confidence there people are terrified so that does two things they're not confident in doing the job and so they're terrified you have high attrition low uh low retention and then the customer that you're exposing this new person to has no confidence in the company because they're talking to somebody who doesn't know what they're doing. They're absolutely right. They don't know that this person's first day on the phones is today and they get to be the guinea pig and the victim. So I, I take the process of, from law enforcement of developing scenarios and I apply it to other industries, banking, uh, travel, you know, medical. You create a middle step where they get to two weeks of theory and then they have some time where they work in e-learning simulators of a call with an e-learning simulator of a software and they get used to doing both at the same time. And then the next step, baby step, is you have coaches, instructors, mentors, uh, A performers get on phone calls and following a script based on actual calls, they talk to that person and while they're operating in a sandbox of the software or another simulation uh, software simulator. That gives them the confidence. They're allowed to make mistakes, they're allowed to fail in safety. And that's something I've seen, I've read lately too, is a safe place to fail. People learn best by failing, but if they're failing on the phones, they get fired. I've seen so many industries that, well, you're not a performer, we're gonna fire you. Maybe they just need a little more time learning how to talk at the same time they're operating software. That's a, that's a very high level performance. It's not something anybody can just do out of the box. So using, I, for one of my jobs, I created a script based on actual phone calls I listened to where I wrote down key, um, key commentary from the customer, you know, responses or interjections with an outcome. What is the ultimate outcome of this? And a personality. This person is aggressive. This person is scared. This person doesn't know what's going on. This person's 90 years old, you know, things like that. And then you give that script to the role player and then they have to stick to that script while they're talking to this person trying to sell them something or trying to troubleshoot. So that's the first thing that I'm working on is taking and breaking down the silos and making it clear that instructional designers are experts in developing training, not experts in coding or travel or real estate. The second thing I'm working on is taking the corporate understanding, well, that's a that's a in quotes understanding of instructional design but taking the corporate world development of instructional design and applying it to law enforcement. Because law enforcement training, there are very good instructors who are getting, who are doing the best they can, but they don't have the tools. I was, I had been in, uh, I'd been in law enforcement for seven years before I found out that there was an actual science to instructional design, that there was actual processes, there were actual words I could use. And for those seven years, I was training other instructors on how to develop training. And I was doing the same that they were doing. I expanded on it, but wow, did my mind open up. So one of the things I'm doing now is I'm developing a, an actual training for law enforcement instructors on how to be instructional designers. They already know 60% of it. They don't know how to apply it. They don't know the other 40%, which will make them true practitioners and develop training that's far more effective. People think that law enforcement suffers because of systemic whatever, or because of uh, uh, because they're angry or whatever like that. It's not that law enforcement get a lot of training, but the training isn't as effective because it's not going after the same stuff that the corporate world goes after. So those are the two things I'm working on. Uh, how successful we, we are, we'll find out at my eulogy, I guess. <laughs> All right, let, thank you for that. Let me shift gears here again. Uh, is th my next question is about uh, terminology, the language within the instructional design and performance worlds. Um, and I asked this question because our language is kind of a mess. We have a lot of overlapping terms, uh, competing terms for the same kinds of things here. And it causes a lot of issues, especially for new people coming into the field, uh, as well as to our clients. But so my question is, is there a favorite performance improvement term or phrase that you would like to define for us? Perhaps you feel it's being misused or misconstrued, but but so what would be a, a term that you can define for us? Well, that's a that's a, a good question. 
I spent a lot of time thinking about it because it's something that's also pretty frustrating for me. Um, coming from philosophy, words matter. Words have meanings, words have purpose. Coming from art, I learned that the only difference between art and trash is marketing. I think a lot of the terminology that people are trying to interject into the learning environment, the learning and development environment is marketing. They're trying to make things softer. They're trying to, by trying to be more precise, they're just muddying the waters more. I think that uh, a lot of the problem with the term instructional designer, so many people are trying to reinvent a term for what an instructional designer is. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't muddled because of the learning and development environment. It was muddled by businesses thinking that instructional design is graphic arts for training. It's not. Instructional design is a process. It's a development. So people trying to reinvent words or terms or titles in order to make instructional design sound like what they want to do isn't, isn't clarifying anything because businesses don't care. The only people that care are the people that are in the industry. All we're doing is muddying the waters of what is somebody doing. If you are excellent with Photoshop and Storyline and uh, instruct and uh, InDesign, you're a graphic artist. You're not an instructional designer. Because you're using those tools to develop training doesn't make you an instructional designer. If you have written hundreds of pages of technical documents as, and, and you go into instructional design, you're a content developer. You're not an instructional designer. An instructional designer is somebody who analyzes, designs, develops, implements, and evaluates. It's somebody who knows how to look at something and say, what are you trying to accomplish? This is the best way to accomplish that. Development can be done by the content developers and the, and the uh, graphic artists, but then the evaluation, the implementation is a partnership, train the trainer, and then the evaluation is another element that doesn't exist in a content developer or in a graphic artist, you've got to evaluate not only how did they perform, but you have to evaluate was my training effective and evaluate the impact on the environment and the ecology around that training. So I don't have a favorite term. I have a, I have a desire to just, you know, let's clear the waters and just call things what they are and then hold people accountable. I, I hear this all the time from a hiring manager or hiring people and recruiters like, well, I, I got 100 applications for instructional designer. I literally saw this on an application. I showed people, I trained people on how to, um, how to lay out a table at the restaurant I worked at. I'm now an instructional designer. No, you're an instructor. You might have been excellent at that. You didn't design anything because you didn't evaluate their performance. They were either fired or they went on and help the tables. So I don't know if I, if I'm a snob or if I'm being mean, but you know, I, I do call myself a learning strategist because I don't just look at, you know, what am I building in this course? I'm looking at what is the impact of this course on the environment of all the courses and how can I design it so that it can stand alone, but also fit into the miasma of all the other training that's been developed. So I look at training programs. I look at how can we effectively develop people, but also be efficient in developing things that have multiple uses in different places, either through remediation or through developing other skill sets. Thank you. Yeah, our language is uh, very challenging, and uh, especially for new people. Um, I've been in the business for 41 years now, and it's uh, it was an issue back then, and some of the thought leaders, gurus back then complained about our language, but uh, and it's, it's certainly not gotten any better, and it, it has a lot to do with businesses and marketing and trying to differentiate things that aren't really too different. But um, let, let's, uh, let me shift again here to, I'd like a chance for you to do a shout out, call out to people who have had a major impact in your development in this world of instructional design and performance improvement. And uh, so and, and as a way to, and perhaps these are names that you know other people aren't gonna recognize, or perhaps there are names that others will recognize. And I'd like to point people to people, resources that have been influential to you so that perhaps they can check them out further themselves. But so, Talk to me a little bit about uh, some of the people that uh, have had an impact in your in terms of your approach to performance-based instruction, because that's what I hear you talking about. It's all about instruction that 
really has got a performance focus and terminal uh, performance is understood and then that's what you strive for. Who has influenced you? Who should people pay attention to? Um, there's always going to be those people that stand out that everyone should like, you know, following you and listening to the, you know, your videos and, and reading the materials that you write are, are exceptionally useful. Uh, Will Tallheimer, uh, uh, Richter, um, and then people like Melissa Milloway, she does a lot for trying to help develop the community here in North. Um, I, there's a lot of people in the community. I think that the best place to learn is by being in the community. Um, I do these, you know, you've noticed I do these unpopular position posts. And I do these not necessarily to pick a fight or to talk about how, or to show how brilliant I am. I don't think I am. I just like to think a lot. Uh, but to generate conversations and communications. Um, you learn best through conversation. You learn best through debate. Um, there's a lot of material out there. I read articles. I read science articles. I read, you know, scholarly research like uh, um, part of that training I'm developing for law enforcement instructors. You know, not only do I say that life, uh, that learning styles is a myth, I went out and I found the research and I read the research. I read the research methodology that says learning styles are a myth and here's the evidence. So diving and delving down and being willing to research and read everything will do a lot for helping people get up. But there are the names that you wanna follow, like I, I listed before. So um, reading basic philosophy, you know, read John Locke. It's not going to be something that you're going to jump up in the morning and want to grab that book and sit down with, but uh, it's, it's knowledge. If you're not learning, you're not a learning professional to me. I've, I've, and I've helped a lot of friends who are developing training programs. They're like, so how do we find good instructors? Ask them this question. What was the last thing you learned and when was it? It's kind of like dating sites when people go and they see these these dating sites, these uh, profiles where it's like, oh, I'm a I ride mountain bikes and I go skiing, and you go on a date and you find out they went mountain biking and skiing 17 years ago. That doesn't make you a skier or a mountain biker. That means that you like doing it once. So if you're not constantly biking and skiing and riding, you're you can't claim to be that person. Same thing with learning professional. I read I read a lot. And I read voraciously because I don't like not knowing. I'm innately curious. And I think that's a trait that it would be found on every instructional designer and the people who are the movers and shakers in the industry now. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing this interview with me. My, my final question is uh, parting words of wisdom, uh, guidance that you might have for people that are new coming into the profession of uh, instructional design, what would your guidance be for them? Um, I think the best guidance I could have is to not be afraid to question. Uh, you're gonna have roles where people will just tell you what to do, question, push, because if you're not asking the questions, you're not getting, you're not doing an analysis. Um, there's, a, there's a matrix I created for people who are just getting into it. I call it the scope of work performed. And understanding what your expectations and what your responsibilities are, are super important. Um, there, I think it's important to not only know what your role is, and your role isn't just making pretty training, your role is to develop other people. Your role is to be the uh, canary in the, in, the, in the coal mine through analysis, through trends, and being able to steer people towards success. So while you're, you might be great at Photoshop, get great at analysis, but read stuff you don't agree with. And then when you don't agree with it, find ways of arguing against it, even if it's with yourself. Don't do it on LinkedIn because then everybody is just going to get angry. But have reasons for everything you're doing. If it boils down to, I just feel that way, that's not a good reason. That's not that. That's not an expert position. Experts provide resources, citations, evidence. So, always be perpetually learning, and always seek out knowledge from other people. It's uh, 
I don't know. I don't, I don't know if I'm communicating that well or not. <laughs> no, I think that's, that's good advice. I mean, that's, um, yeah, you, you need to be questioned. You need to understand why you are doing what you're doing, why you think what you're thinking, but, uh, no, that's good advice for new people coming in. Rick, thank you so much again for doing this uh, video interview with me today over Zoom. Uh, good luck in your future, and I'm looking forward to reading more of your posts on LinkedIn. Appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. It's uh, been a good time. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.